You know, I remember watching a documentary years ago about the Through Gates of Splendor story. You know, it's the story of those five missionaries, Nate Saint and Jim Elliott, those guys. If you're not familiar, it's a story from the 50s where these missionaries were trying to reach a remote tribe called the Waudauni deep in the jungles of Ecuador. And to make a long story short, all the missionaries end up getting killed by the natives because, of course, they had no idea who they were, these strange foreigners. And it's a tragic story, but it has a happy ending because in the end, like the whole tribe ends up becoming Christian and some of the wives and children actually ended up moving into the jungle and living with the tribe. It's a pretty cool story. And near the end of the documentary, I think it was Nate Saint's son, Steve is his name, he ends up taking one of the older native guys from the tribe to visit America. And if I remember right, this was actually one of the warriors that had helped to kill the missionaries on the beach. So again, you got to picture this. It's the son of one of the missionaries that got killed, taking one of the guys that killed his dad on a trip to America. And it's like the first time he's ever going to see civilization. And you got to imagine, like from the perspective of the Waudani, these were very primitive people back then, cut off from all civilization. So this must have been like going to an alien planet or something. And it's so funny how Steve tells a story about how, you know, this Waudani tribesman is experiencing and reacting to all of the wonders of the modern world for the first time. In fact, I can't really do it justice. Let's just watch this clip. He said, some of the foreigners are so nice that even when you're, when you're driving, you just stop by their houses and, and you go to one of, the, one of the openings in their walls. And he said, they just open it for you and, and then they start giving you food and it's already hot and it's already cooked and stuff. He said, I see those foreigners very, very well. When Minkai came back from the States the first time, he told the people that the foreigners are really big and fat because even when they go walking, they don't move their feet. They just get on the trail and the trail moves. Well, Ompore, his wife said, oh, you're talking wild. Minkai just kept saying, that's why all the foreigners are fat. They don't walk, they don't climb, they don't make gardens. But when they got to that one, Ompura oh just, she just said, well, how are they going to live then? Minkai said, they have these big food houses. And he said, there's just piles of food. First, there's these young people and they're standing at the place where you go out and you smile as big as you can. And he said, they pretend like they're not seeing you. And then he said, then after a little while, then they look at you and they smile. And he said, when they smile, boom, you can just go and take all the food with you. And I said, well, it's, it's kind of like that. So I just took out my credit card and I said, first you have to give them something like this. And Minkai looked at all of them, he smiled. And he said, they just give it right back to you. You know, I'm trying to put myself in the place of that tribesman. And just imagine what it would be like not to grow up with all of this technology and to watch it develop over the course of your life and just always have this intuitive understanding of how it all works. Because, you know, this is something that is as familiar to us as the jungle probably is to that guy. And, you know, if you don't know how something works, it's just going to seem miraculous to you. I mean, you know, he was talking in that clip about credit cards. Just think for a moment about how ridiculously complicated a credit card is. Steve's like, yeah, you have to give them a card like this if you want to buy the food. And the guy's like, yeah, but they just give it right back to you. How could you ever even begin to explain something like a credit card to someone who has literally no understanding of how anything in the modern world works? You tell them, well, you know, you swipe this little piece of plastic that has an electronic chip on the inside. Wait, what's plastic? What's a chip? Don't worry about that right now. The credit card machine reads the chip, then it takes the data and encrypts it. Wait, what's data? What's encrypt? I can't explain that to you right now. Your encrypted data is being uploaded via the internet to the merchant's bank. Wait, what is upload? What is the internet? What is merchant? What is bank? You see how incredibly complicated everything is. You know, if you could take your smartphone, as incredible as it is, and you could go back a thousand years, it would actually be useless 
There's no internet back then, no electricity, no other users, no backend support infrastructure. Because you see, the technology isn't just amazing in and of itself. It works because it exists in a whole world full of almost impossible wonders. And when everything is working together, then you can take this little flat square object and you can look in the glass and you can speak face to face with someone on the other side of the world in real time. So what is the difference between that and a miracle? Well, from the vantage point of somebody living in the Stone Age who knows nothing, there is no difference. Your iPhone would seem like a miracle. They'd probably be offering sacrifices to it. Okay, so what if there's actually no such thing as a miracle, per se? What if every miracle, in fact, has a completely natural explanation, and the fact that it seems miraculous to you just means that you don't fully understand it yet? Well, this is definitely not my view, but this was the view of a 17th century Dutch philosopher by the name of Benedictus de Spinoza, who, at least in the latter part of his career, was a pantheist. So that means he believed that God and the universe were basically the same thing. According to Spinoza, God is not this personal deity. He is actually the infinite, all-encompassing thing that comprises all of existence, including nature and human beings themselves. And so, as you can imagine, miracles were a kind of ridiculous concept to Spinoza. Because in his mind, the laws of nature are basically just the same thing as the laws of God's nature. So if you discover something about the world, that's the same as discovering something about God. And Spinoza saw miracles as a suspension or a violation of the laws of nature. So that would mean that miracles are God violating the laws of God's own nature. And that to a pantheist like Spinoza was absurd on its face. So then how does he deal with the miracles of the Bible? Well, he basically argues that whenever we see what appears to be a miracle, either in the world around us or even in the Bible itself, it always has some rational, natural explanation. And he gives lots of examples of this in his book. For example, he talks about the story where Joshua says that the sun stood still. And so his explanation is he says, that back then, instead of describing it by saying, hey, that day felt longer than usual, what they did is they embellished the story so that their enemies, who, by the way, were people that worshiped the sun, would think, whoa, there must be some serious supernatural power behind these guys. Look at what he says in his theological political treatise. Quote, they therefore plainly trifle who, when they do not know a thing, fall back upon the will of God, a most ridiculous way of professing or excusing ignorance. We may safely conclude anew that a miracle, whether contrary to nature or above nature, is a sheer absurdity, and therefore that by a miracle in holy writ, we are to understand nothing more than a natural phenomenon which surpasses or is believed to surpass human powers of comprehension, end quote. Now, if you remember in the last episode, as I was tracing the historical development of modern cessationism, we left off at the time of the Reformation, and I told you that even then, even the cessationism of Calvin and Luther was still not this toxic variant that we see today in modern cessationism. That required the advent of the Enlightenment. And what happened in the Enlightenment was that rationalism and empiricism, skepticism, naturalism all got added into the mix, resulting in a brand new style of cessationism that was cynical and polemic. And rather than making its arguments from the Bible, now they were appealing to reason and philosophy. And I mention this argument from Spinoza because it's a good example of what I'm talking about here. And I want to give you a couple more because I want to show you, especially when we get to Benjamin Warfield, examples of how this worldly wisdom crept into modern cessationist doctrine. And I'm going to have to pick just a couple of examples here for the sake of time. But let's just talk for a minute about David Hume. Now, I mentioned Hume briefly in the last episode, he was an 18th century Scottish empiricist. Now, empiricists are different from rationalists in that, you know, the rationalists thought that you could just use logic and reason alone to deduce truth in the world, all in your mind, without ever relying on any experience. 
And this is where we get the idea, by the way, of a priori knowledge. We'll talk more about that later. But a priori means prior to experience. It's the kind of knowledge that you can have just by thinking and just by using your brain. Okay, But empiricists like Hume had a different perspective. They thought that the best way to know stuff in the world is by actually seeing it, by feeling it, by experiencing it firsthand. So they didn't put much stock in abstract reasoning or innate ideas. They were all about looking at the actual world around them and using solid hands-on proof to back up what they believe. And Hume, like many empiricists, was very skeptical about all miracles, including the miracles of the Bible. And his book, a famous book, by the way, called An Inquiry Concerning Human Understanding, makes some very famous arguments against miracles. Here's the general maxim that he uses that tells us how to evaluate miracle testimonies. He says, quote, No testimony is sufficient to establish a miracle unless the testimony be of such a kind that its falsehood would be more miraculous than the fact which it endeavors to establish. And even in that case, there is a mutual destruction of arguments and the superior only gives us an assurance suitable to that degree of force, which remains after deducing the inferior, end quote. In other words, here's how you should handle a miracle testimony, according to David Hume. Say somebody comes to you and says that their broken arm was healed. You should ask yourself, what would be more miraculous for the person to be lying about that or for their arm to actually have been healed? And I mean, most of the time, obviously, not believing the miracle happened is going to be the natural thing to do. So basically, Hume is saying, you should go with that. You should go with that gut instinct, that common sense skepticism. But here's the, here's the reality. Even if it would be more miraculous for that person to actually be lying, like, I'm not even sure how that would work. I guess you could imagine that there's a scenario where they have three doctors that have all independently taken x-rays from before and after the healing and it was a compound fracture, so the bone was sticking out through an open wound. It was clearly visible. And they have 4K security footage that shows the whole thing from beginning to end. And you're sure that none of it was doctored. And there's a dozen people who all witnessed it. And by the way, these are all part of the you know, National Society of Skeptics or something. They all watched the miracle happen right before their eyes. And... There doesn't seem to be any way to fabricate all of that witness testimony and all the witnesses seem credible and they have nothing to gain from their testimony and, and, and for whatever reasons you decide that if all of that is a lie, then the lie itself would actually be a greater miracle than the healing. Even then, Hume says, you, sh you still should not believe it. Your assurance should only be what's left after you subtract the weaker argument. So imagine that on a scale of one to 10, the strength of the argument for the miracle is like an eight. And the strength of the argument against the miracle is like a six, okay? What you should do is now subtract one from the other. So eight minus six is two, right? So you can say, even with all of that evidence, where it would be a bigger miracle if the person were lying, even then, your level of confidence should only be a two. And in fact... According to Hume, you can actually never really believe a miracle testimony or have any decent amount of confidence in it. Because even when there is an extraordinary amount of testimony for a miracle, he says there's always going to be more testimony against it. What does he mean by that? Well, Hume says that a miracle, by definition, is a violation of the laws of nature. And what is a law of nature other than something that is the universal experience of humans everywhere? So you can see a little bit of that empiricism coming through, right? The laws of nature are established on the basis of universal human experience. So for example, every time I drop something, it falls to the ground. That doesn't happen sometimes. That doesn't happen most of the time. That happens every single time. And not just for me, but for every single person in the whole world who has ever lived. So the complete collective experience of every human being is that what goes up must come down. And as a result, we call that the law of gravity. So Hume says that the fact that we call it a law means that we all agree that this is the universal human experience. And so that is, in Hume's words, as entire an argument from experience as can possibly be imagined. So you can envision a scale. On the one side, you have the collective testimony of every human being ever. That's the law of nature. 
On the other side, you have one person's testimony, which contradicts it. Which should you believe? I mean, even if you have 100 people over here testifying that a miracle happened, it's always going to be outweighed by the fact that the law of nature on the other side of the scale has been established by the weight of every human being testimony ever. Here's Hume's exact quote. A miracle is a violation of the laws of nature, and as a firm and unalterable experience has established these laws, the proof against a miracle from the very nature of the fact is as entire an argument from experience as can possibly be imagined, end quote. In the interest of time, I'm just going to give you one more argument here, and I'm going somewhere with this, so you've got to just hang with me, okay? But this argument comes from the 19th century liberal theologian named Adolf von Harnack. And if you remember in the last episode, I briefly mentioned the way that the philosophy of the Enlightenment ended up making its way into theology. And there were a lot of people that actually ended up rejecting faith completely. But there were also those who wanted to straddle the line. You know, they didn't really believe in the Bible, but they weren't willing to go so far as the deists did, although some actually did go that far. But most of these liberal theologians just wanted to kind of explain the supernatural stuff in the Bible away, turn it into some kind of an allegory, maybe provide an alternative natural explanation for the miracles or whatever. Well, Harnack is one of these guys. And in his book called What is Christianity?, He's talking here about demons and about demon possession. And look at what he says. Quote, nothing in the Gospels strikes us as stranger than the frequently recurring stories of demons and the great importance which the evangelists attach to them. For many among us, the very fact that these writings report such absurdities is sufficient reason for declining to accept them, end quote. So if it's absurd, all these stories of demons in the New Testament, what is the explanation for the, these accounts of demon possession? Well, he says, quote, if modern science were to declare nervous disease to consist in great part of possession, and the newspapers were to spread this announcement amongst the public, the same thing would recur. We should soon have numerous cases in which nervous patients looked as if they were in the grip of an evil spirit and themselves believed that they were so. Theory and belief would work by suggestion, and again create a class of demoniacs amongst the insane, just as they created them hundreds, nay, thousands of years ago. It is unhistorical and foolish to attribute any particular notion or theory about demons and the demoniac to the Gospels and the evangelists. They only shared the general notions of their time, end quote. So there's several interesting things going on here, but for the sake of time, I just want you to notice one thing in particular. Harnack is pointing here to the power of suggestion as a way of explaining people that think they're demon-possessed. You know, if they're told that demons possess people, and if that becomes part of their worldview, then maybe they'll understand their own mental illness in that light. Or maybe even the suggestion itself could cause the manifestations to happen in the first place. And, you know, this is something that was obviously being talked about a lot at that time. Doctors were starting to notice things like the placebo effect, although they weren't calling it that yet. But they were noticing the ways that things like the power of suggestion could actually have certain effects on the psyche. Here's Harnack again. He says, quote, Our acquaintance, even with the forces inherent in matter and with the field of their action, is incomplete, while of psychic forces we know very much less. We see that a strong will and a firm faith exert an influence upon the life of the body and produce phenomena which strike us as marvelous. Who is there up to now that has set any sure bounds to the province of the possible and the actual? No one. Who can say how far the influence of the soul upon soul and of soul upon body reaches? No one. Who can still maintain that any extraordinary phenomenon that may appear in this domain is entirely based on error and delusion? Miracles, it is true, do not happen, but of the marvelous and the inexplicable, there is plenty. End quote. Now, you'll notice that this argument has some similarity with Spinoza and Hume. You know, if there's no natural explanation... That just means that there's something about nature you don't understand yet. But Harnack adds the idea that these natural things might actually be affected by faith and belief itself. In other words, faith and belief might just actually be the natural effects upon the mind and the body that we don't fully understand yet. Now, hopefully none of those arguments shook you. If they did, don't worry. I'm going to deal with them before we finish today. 
But I'm showing you these arguments because I want you to understand the kind of arguments against miracles that came out of the Enlightenment. And remember, in the last episode, I showed you how modern cessationism began to take form in the Reformation, and then it mutated into the toxic variant that we have today during the time of the Enlightenment. And that's because what happened was that same kind of cynical skepticism got in there. And it was a skepticism rooted in a deep kind of unbelief that really, at its core, was antichrist. And I showed you that last time. John Ruffin says, quote, Calvin had established a theological rationale for the polemic based on a few, albeit important, scriptural proof texts, but primarily on an evolved and internally inconsistent role of miracles. But during the Enlightenment, the basis of religious authority underwent a profound shift from the Protestant basis of biblical authority to the human authority of perception and reason. The Enlightenment era is generally regarded as the watershed in thought about miracles, end quote. And then guys like Conyers Middleton that we talked about last time took that critical historical methodology of the skeptics and the philosophers and even the deists of his day and applied that methodology to all post-biblical miracles. And then Benjamin Warfield, who became the godfather of modern cessationism, wrote a seminal book called Counterfeit Miracles in which he adopted Middleton's skeptical rationalist historical methodology. And Warfield is the guy that I want to talk about a little bit today because this is where we see one of the most vivid examples of how modern cessationism actually comes from, at its root, Greek philosophy and Enlightenment era rationalism and empiricism and skepticism and a way of thinking that is fundamentally Epicurean and Aristotelian and naturalist, and even deist. And it's completely contrary to the teachings of Christ and the apostles. You know, it reminds me of an interview that I saw with John MacArthur. I think it was during that whole strange fire thing they did a few years back. And he was talking about the charismatic movement and why, in his mind, it's such a threat. And he said that it wasn't because they were speaking gibberish or having spiritual impressions. He said it was because... He thinks that charismatics are living in a paradigm outside of Scripture, and nothing good happens there. The the, the seriousness of the threat is not somebody standing in a corner speaking gibberish. Um, And I've actually said to people, you'd be better off to go in a corner and speak nonsense than to come out of the corner and gossip. So, you know, we we don't want to say that that's the threat. Um, The the, the vast... uh, negative aspect of this movement doesn't come from people who seem to have spiritual impressions. It comes from living in a paradigm outside Scripture, which is what we were trying to say this morning, because nothing good happens out there. You know, it's amazing to me how someone can so perfectly and accurately identify their own problem, project it onto everybody else, and fail to see the hypocrisy. No, Pastor MacArthur, cessationism is the unbiblical paradigm. I can find prophecy and tongues and healing and exorcism and miracles all throughout the New Testament. These things are very, very biblical. But I defy you or any cessationist to produce one single solitary verse that supports cessationism. In fact, where's my list of cessationist scriptures? We haven't pulled this out in a while, have we? Let me remind you all of the cessationist scriptures that there are in the Bible. Here's the list. Remember, there's not one scripture in the Bible That supports cessationism. And yet, there's an entire doctrinal camp built around this idea. It's hard to imagine something more unbiblical that not only disregards and disobeys explicit commands of Scripture, but goes against the whole spirit of the Bible that was written by prophets and miracle workers about a God that is speaking and moving among his people in the world. And that's because, as I'm showing you, the modern cessationist worldview does not come from the Bible. It comes from Enlightenment era rationalism and empiricism and skepticism and naturalism and even deism. Now, I'm not saying that cessationists are deists, but what I am absolutely saying is that these ideas grow on the same substrate. In fact, let me just give you this illustration because 
In previous episodes, I've discussed the distinction between modern cessationism and what the Reformers and Church Fathers believed, and so on. And so, just in case this distinction isn't clear, I drew this little spectrum for you. You can see here that I put deism all the way to the far left side of the spectrum. Because, you know, as much as cessationists will probably cringe at this, let's face it, deism is really just an extreme form of cessationism, right? I mean, deists believe that God created the world with a miracle and then ceased to interact with it anymore after he got it going. And likewise, cessationists believe that God started the church with miracles and then ceased to operate that way anymore after the church got going. And the similarity here is not incidental. Modern cessationism and deism both have roots in the intellectual and philosophical tradition of the Enlightenment, and they actually developed for some of the exact same reasons. I'm not going to try to make that case today, but it's not a difficult thing to do, honestly. Next, we have what I'm calling hardline total cessationism, which is essentially just a softer deism. This is what we see, for example, in guys like Conyers Middleton, who, again, we talked about in the last episode, who was, by the way, accused in his time of being borderline deist and definitely heterodox. And, you know, these hardliners... While they might say that they believe in miracles in theory, because, you know, they're theists. And yet they are often completely unwilling to accept any suggestion that God has done any miracles at any point in the last 2,000 years since the apostolic age came to an end. And honestly, even Warfield that we're going to talk about today is borderline here. I mean, as you'll see, he accepts the possibility of miracles because he's got to keep that door open in theory. But it seems like there's nothing that could actually convince him that a genuine miracle has happened. So he's kind of like a total cessationist in a practical sense. But it's also tricky because, you know, he's a lot more tactful than Middleton was. And he knows how to conceal his contempt and wrap his skepticism in a much more palatable theological package. And he's pretty conservative theologically in other ways. And, you know, this is always so strange to me. He's also a Calvinist. So he actually believes that God is manipulating everything in the universe all the time. Like in one sense, that's the furthest thing you could imagine from deism. He, and he claims to believe in the supernatural here and now. But it's just this strange aversion to miracles that makes him so unreasonable. And so all things considered, I guess he's somewhere between the hardline total cessationist view and the next one that I have here. Next, we have modern cessationism, which is really what this series is addressing. And of course, modern cessationism is a bit more moderate, but it's still very highly influenced by that same Enlightenment era thinking that the hardline brand of total cessationism is, which is what I've been showing you. But there are also other kinds of cessationists as well. And I want to just mention them quickly. I call them observational and simple cessationists. Actually, I would say that most cessationists in the world today are probably what I would classify as simple cessationists. Most probably don't even know that they're a cessationist. They probably never even heard the term cessationist. They've never studied pneumatology. They've never read a theological textbook. They've probably never even given two seconds of thought to the subject of cessationism. They assume that miracles don't occur because they've never seen one, and because everybody around them has had the same lack of experience. They have no theological axe to grind, and they'd probably change their position in a heartbeat if they were given new and better doctrine. There's one other group that I want to mention. It's a group that I call observational cessationists. And unlike the simple cessationists, these guys are a bit more theologically informed, but they still embrace cessationism not because of their theology, but in spite of it. And this is the category where I would put all of the supposed cessationist statements from the church fathers, like we've seen in the previous episodes. Sometimes they said things that sounded continuationist. Other times they said things that sounded cessationist. And when their statements sound cessationist, they're just being observational, not dogmatic. They're just trying to explain or maybe justify the fact that they're not experiencing the miraculous or at least not experiencing it to the extent that they thought they should have been. But at no point... Were they making systematic theological arguments against the modern operation of the miraculous gifts like modern cessations do, much less using some kind of cynical, critical, rationalistic polemic against the gifts of the Spirit? 
Now, there's also a lot of people that I would put in the category of observational cessationists today. They're not arguing for cessationism from a theological perspective. In fact, they might even know the scriptures well enough to realize that it's impossible to make a cogent theological argument for cessationism. And yet, they're still cessationists in practice for whatever reason. Maybe they just don't know any better. Maybe they lack the confidence to step out. For example, I'd put the Southern Baptist evangelist Paul Washer in this category. I saw a video online where somebody asked him if he believes that speaking in tongues is for today. Here's what he said. Even though men godlier than I would disagree with me, theologically or doctrinally, I do not say that tongues have ceased. All right, so everybody thinks, oh man, he believes in tongues. No, hold it. I just don't think that's the issue. When I go to the text, I cannot... You know, I see the arguments and stuff, but I can't say that I can say in my conscience that these things have ceased. But here's what I do do. Um, I look at what tongues are in the scriptures and I don't see them anywhere today. What I see in the scriptures as being tongues and I compare that to, to people who say they speak in tongues, I see something completely different. So see, I, I, some people are cessationists. That means they believe tongues have ceased. I kind of call myself a practical cessationist in the sense that I do not say those things have ceased. I've seen God heal people. You know, but have I seen a man who had the gift of healing? No. Have I? Have I? Here's what I think. I, I believe tongues in the book of Acts. Every time it occurs, it is, a, it is a real phonetic language. It is. It's a real phonetic language. And uh, those are the only examples of tongues we have, and they're real phonetic languages. And when they occurred, everybody knew something supernatural was going on. He goes on to concede that he's heard from godly Baptist and Presbyterian missionaries that, quote-unquote, strange things have occurred on the fringe of missions which reports he seems to indicate he believes. Now, putting aside some of the problems with his rationale for a moment, this is a perfect example of what I'm calling observational cessationism. He cannot in good conscience make a theological case for cessationism. On the other hand, he hasn't seen what he believes are authentic expressions of the gifts either. So his cessationism is not scriptural or theological or polemical, but it is, as he put it, practical. So, just to reiterate, modern cessationism and everything to its left on that spectrum is grounded in enlightenment rationalism. And, you know, cessationist teachers, they can try to dress it up by twisting certain proof texts and making certain biblical sounding arguments. But, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses can do that, too. Mormons can do that, too. You know the saying, you can put lipstick on a pig, but it's still a pig. You can slap a scripture on Greek philosophy that doesn't make it Christian. But, you know, Benjamin Warfield's book, Counterfeit Miracles, is, in my experience, the most widely quoted among cessationists, especially when it comes to making the historical case that miracles have ceased. And his book is basically one long ad hominem polemic against miracles. It doesn't make its case primarily from Scripture, but from history. And, you know, John Ruffin, who I quoted quite a bit in the last episode, wrote a book called On the Cessation of the Charismata. And I highly recommend Ruffin's work to anybody who wants a more thorough treatment of Warfield. I mean, Ruffin takes Warfield apart. And that's not a small feat either, because, you know, Warfield was an intellectual giant. So, you know, demolishing his arguments the way that Ruffin does is quite remarkable. But then again, you know, cessationism is so irrational and so inconsistent that it makes even really smart people seem really dumb and dishonest. I would say, you know, as a general rule, cessationist teachers are at their most vulnerable point theologically and rationally when they argue for cessationism. Reminds me of what George Campbell said in his dissertation where he was responding to David Hume, who was obviously one of the intellectual giants of his time. And he said, you know, basically, I would be at a huge disadvantage against an opponent this smart 
if it weren't for the fact that I'm on the side of truth and defending what is obviously true only requires the opportunity for a fair hearing and a clear explanation, and you don't need exceptional skills for that. On the other hand, he says, quote, but to adorn error with a semblance of truth and to make the worse appear the better reason requires all the arts of ingenuity and invention, arts in which few or none have been more expert than Mr. Hume, end quote. And that's the case here, too. You know, the most brilliant thing about Warfield's cessationist polemic is the ingenuity and invention that has gone into him trying to make the worse appear the better reason. But even for Warfield, it's just too much to ask. But I want to clarify here why I'm taking the time to talk about Warfield. There's actually three really important reasons. The first thing is that Warfield's influence on modern cessationism is so ubiquitous that it just cannot be ignored. Most modern cessationist theologians derive their brand of cessationism either directly or indirectly from Warfield himself. And I say that because his arguments have just been copied and adopted and recycled by these guys ever since. You know, that cessationist conference that provoked me to do this series, I actually got a list of the speakers and I searched through the writings of all the guys that I was familiar with. And every single one of them has multiple references to Warfield relating to cessationism. And oftentimes they don't just quote him, they praise him with epithets like that great Princeton theologian. Cessationists love Warfield and they copy his arguments like lemmings. It's just so precious. You know, David Hume, his followers have had to update his arguments in the centuries since he made them because they're out of date. You know, Hume wrote in the days before the development of probability theory, and it was a time when the Newtonian model of physics was still the standard model. And his arguments hadn't taken all these new things into account. So his followers have had to update his arguments to make them more robust. But cessationists haven't managed to improve on Warfield one bit. They haven't come up with anything better. They haven't come up with anything new in a hundred years. They just copy Warfield as though they don't realize that his arguments have been thoroughly refuted theologically and historically, and even by the fact that since he died, the Pentecostal and charismatic movements have provided more historical evidence against his arguments than the previous 19 centuries combined. But cessationists just keep parroting the same old worn out arguments that their hero was making more than a century ago. And it's not just the specific arguments. It's the spirit of it as well that seems to go back to Warfield. I'm talking about his rationalistic approach to miracles, where the arguments aren't based on scripture, but on appeals to logic, where people are making assumptions about what miracles would or should look like if they're real, and then arguing against modern miracles on that basis. Or, you know, basically looking upon all modern miracle claims with a kind of cynical, scornful antagonism or a kind of naturalistic paradigm that tends to automatically doubt the supernatural, or the toleration of this cognitive dissonance that treats modern miracles by one set of measurements and biblical miracles with another. All of this seems to go back to Warfield. That's the first thing. Warfield is the modern cessationist godfather. Be my friend. Godfather. Second, it's super easy to show the link between Warfield's ideas and the Enlightenment era rationalists and critics of his day. And as I've already mentioned, this means that his method is coming from Enlightenment thinking, not biblical thinking. And like MacArthur said, it's a paradigm outside Scripture, and that's important for us to notice. And most importantly, because counterfeit miracles specifically and Warfield's views more generally are so ensconced in cessationist thinking that by refuting him, I'm actually refuting the whole modern cessationist camp. So why refute, you know, so-and-so speaking at the cessationist conference when I can refute the guy that these cessationist teachers got their ideas from? So let me just give you four or five things that Warfield does in this book that are very concerning. And we'll see how much I have time to get through today. But here's the first one. Warfield tends to evaluate miracle claims on the basis of rationalism rather than scripture. For example, he will reject reports of partial healings on the basis that, quote, it must remain astonishing in any event that miracles should be frequently incomplete. We should a priori expect miraculous cures to be regularly radical, end quote. Now, here's some of that rationalism coming through because 
you know, the term a priori is a dead giveaway. Remember, we talked about this earlier. The term a priori refers to knowledge that is based on nothing other than intuition. It's just thinking. It's knowledge that doesn't come through the senses or from any real world experience, but through reason alone. And of course, Warfield was more in that rationalist camp. And that's why he's approaching the subject this way. So here's what he's saying. If I sit here and imagine a priori what a miracle would look like, then I would expect it to be more impressive than what I'm seeing. And so some of the miracles that Warfield had heard about were only partial, like, for example, a partial healing. And in Warfield, that discredits them. But why? Well, because to Warfield, miraculous cures have to be more radical. Based on what, Warfield? Based on my a priori expectations. In other words, it has nothing to do with anything that he sees in the Bible, nothing that he's seen or experienced in the real world. It's just the way that Warfield feels. It's the way that his own preconceived expectations tell him that things should be. So imagine a person is blind in two eyes. They get prayed for. They're only healed in one. Well, that's not good enough for Warfield because if it's real, both eyes should be opened. Now, you know, I've actually had this happen in real life. I've prayed for people that were blind in two eyes and I prayed for them and only one eye opened. So what did I do? Reject the miracle because it wasn't as extensive as I wanted it to be? No, I prayed again. And there's been many, many times when the person that I pray for was healed actually the second or third time that I prayed. And guess what? This even happened with Jesus. Remember the blind man in Mark 8? Remember Jesus spit on the man's eyes, then asked if he could see, and the man said what? I see like men like trees walking. In other words, his eyes were only partially healed, but not totally. So what did Jesus do? He touched the man again. And the second time it says that he saw clearly. Now, I know cessationists have all kinds of explanations for why that happened. And all those explanations are well and good. But the fact remains that Jesus Christ himself experienced a partial miracle at one point. You see something similar when Warfield talks about healing houses. These were apparently places where people would go and check in like if it were a hospital or something, and then they would just receive constant prayer until they got healed. Warfield says, quote, the very existence of faith houses indeed is the sufficient refutation of the doctrine of faith healing, which seeks support from them. By hypothesis, a miraculous cure should be immediate as in cause, so in time, without delay as without means. On the exercise of simple faith, the existence of faith hospitals is a standing proof that it is not immediate, either in cause or in time, that a place of retirement is helpful and that good nursing has its reward, end quote. So again, Warfield has decided a priori that if it takes longer than a certain amount of time, which he is willing to allow, he never tells us how much time he's willing to give God to do a miracle before he decides that it's not valid. But in any case, if he thinks that it's taking too long, that is sufficient reason in his mind to reject a miracle. You know, this hits kind of close to home for me because I've had cessationists post comments on videos that I've uploaded, you know, like, for example, of a, a healing testimony where someone was crippled and now they can walk, but they're still not walking perfectly because, you know, sometimes, you know, if you've seen these things in the real world, you realize that it can take a couple days for a person to experience the full extent of a healing. It doesn't always happen immediately, 100%. So you got these critics mocking and criticizing and insulting and saying all kinds of nasty stuff. It's just so gross. It's cringy. You know, I saw a video of John MacArthur talking about how people being healed of lower back pain isn't convincing to him. I saw another one where there was a bunch of these guys sitting in a Q&A mocking, literally laughing at people who claimed to be healed of things like hurt backs and headaches and stuff that they didn't think was very impressive. And I was like, who do you think you are? How dare you? You know what, cessationist? Maybe the end-all be-all is not you being convinced. Did you ever stop to think that we who are experiencing miracles don't really give a flying leap what you think? And you know what? I think that the attitude that says, if that's what a miracle is, that's not good enough for me. I think it's deeply cynical and ungrateful, maybe even evil. Yes, that's how the writer of Hebrews describes the heart of unbelief that characterized the children of Israel in the wilderness. They were experiencing God's wonders day by day. And yet, rather than bowing in awe and gratitude, they complained 
They criticized, and it grieved God so deeply that he called it an evil heart of unbelief departing from the living God. And it says that he swore in his wrath, they will never enter into my rest. Just imagine, what if God actually did heal that person's lower back pain, and you're sitting there mocking it? You dismissed it. You said, well, I'm not convinced. Do these people have any fear of God? Does it even occur to them that in the highly unlikely scenario, they just might be wrong. I know it's virtually impossible to imagine, but just what if, cessationist, you're actually mocking God? And I know I've already mentioned this, but I think it's worth reiterating that this is exactly what the Pharisees did with Jesus. He's doing miracles left and right. And in that same chapter, they say, we want to see a sign from you. Essentially saying, those miracles you just did, that's not good enough for us. I can almost hear them saying, we should a priori expect miracles to be regularly more radical. And how does Jesus respond? He says, it's a wicked and adulterous generation that seeks a sign. And remember, he's doing miracles all over the place. So he's not saying it's a wicked and adulterous generation that believes God for miracles. He's looking at the Pharisees and saying, it is a wicked and adulterous generation that can stand there as God is moving in power. And rather than respond in humility, demand something more impressive, more immediate, more radical. Here's another one. Sometimes when Warfield encounters a claim that he can't find any explanation for, he simply dodges it by appealing to unknown natural causes. For example, he talks about the case of a man by the name of Pierre de Rutter, and he says de Rutter was reported by a doctor named Dr. Mackey to have been healed of, quote, a fracture of long standing of both bones of the lower leg just below the knee, the two parts of the broken bone piercing the flesh and being separated by a separating wound an inch long. The healing was instantaneous. We have never seen a satisfactory natural explanation of how this cure was affected. If the facts in all their details as published, say in Bertrand's extended account, are authentic, it seems fairly impossible to imagine how it was affected, end quote. So this is a case for which it seems to meet all of Warfield's criteria, including being immediate, instantaneous, complete, all of it. And he doesn't have an answer. Now, look, I don't know if this was a real miracle or not. I don't know who Pierre de Rutter was. I don't know who Dr. Mackey was. I could go digging to see if I can find more information, but it's not even worth the time because what matters is the way Warfield responds to the miracle report that he can't explain. Look what he says. Quote, do you cry out that we are bound to supply a satisfactory natural explanation of it or else acknowledge that a miracle has taken place in this case? We feel no difficulty in declining the dilemma. The healing of Pierre de Rutter's leg is not the only thing that has occurred in the world of the mode of the occurrence of which we are ignorant. After all, inexplicable and miraculous are not exact synonyms, and nobody really thinks that they are. We are only beginning to learn the marvelous behavior of which living tissue is capable. And it may well be that, after a while, it may seem very natural that Pierre de Rutter's case happened just as it is said to have happened. Nature was made by God, not man. And there may be forces working in nature, not only which have not yet been dreamed of in our philosophy, but which are beyond human comprehension altogether. We do not busy ourselves, therefore, with conjecturing how Pierre de Rutter's cure may have happened. We are content to know that in no case was it a miracle, end quote. The problem is, if you're going to take this approach where you just glibly dismiss evidence that contradicts your thesis, then why bother to build a case on evidence at all? Why not just be honest and say from the outset, I refuse to believe in miracles no matter what evidence is presented? And again, why couldn't someone just as easily take these exact same arguments and use this exact same logic and apply it to the miracles of the Bible? I don't know how Jesus walked on water, but we are content to know that in no case was it a miracle. I don't know how Peter's shadow healed the sick, but I am content to know that in no case was it a miracle. I don't know how Moses parted the Red Sea, but I'm content to know that in no case was it a miracle. Guys, that's not an argument. It's the opposite. It's evasion. And it actually undermines his whole argument because it just proves his stubborn, dogmatic determination to believe his presuppositions, no matter what the evidence says. And he does it all under the pretense of rationalism. Remember, we saw the same kind of thinking in Spinoza. And guess what? Spinoza applied that same logic to the Bible. Again, he said, 
Quote, they therefore plainly trifle, who when they do not know a thing, fall back upon the will of God, a most ridiculous way of professing or excusing ignorance. We may safely conclude anew that a miracle, whether contrary to nature or above nature, is sheer absurdity, and therefore that by a miracle in Holy Writ or in the Bible, we are to understand nothing more than a natural phenomenon which surpasses or is believed to surpass human powers of comprehension, end quote. So how do we answer this? Well, first of all, as Christians, we reject this kind of thinking because we aren't pantheists. We don't believe that nature and God are the same thing. God created nature. He is not his creation. He is above his creation and he is over it and he controls it and he can do whatever he wants with it. Spinoza says that, quote, the vulgar, that's us, by the way, fancy that the powers of nature are suspended when God interferes. In this way, two powers are imagined distinct from one another, the power of God and the power of nature, which last, however, is presumed to be influenced and ordered in a certain way by God or as is generally believed at the present time, which is created by God. But what is understood precisely by these two powers? God and nature is not explained, unless it be that God is conceived as a king and a sovereign ruler, whilst nature is imagined as a special subordinate force, end quote. Uh, Yes, Spinoza, that's exactly what we imagine. God is a sovereign king over the whole world. It's hilarious how he lays out this thing that he expects to be seen as some unsolvable dilemma, and then he answers it himself by simply giving the explanation that every Bible-believing Christian has already taken for granted. Yes, God is not the same as nature. He is the creator. He is the first cause above and beyond the natural world. He's the king of the universe. He rules over everything. Problem solved. Now, let's just deal with the definition of miracle that Spinoza gives here. This has come up a couple of times. Remember, he says that A miracle is when, quote, the powers of nature are suspended, end quote. And Hume had a similar definition. Remember, he said that, quote, a miracle is a violation of the laws of nature, end quote. Now, if you've been following the series, you remember a few episodes back, we were talking about gifts of healings, and I gave you Warfield's ridiculously specific definition of miracle. That's not in counterfeit miracles, by the way. That's in A Question of Miracles. And he says in A Question of Miracles that a miracle is a, quote, force outside of nature and specifically above nature, intruding into the complex of natural forces and producing, therefore, in that complex, effects which could not be produced by the natural forces themselves. These effects reveal themselves, therefore, as new, but not as neonatural, but rather as extra natural and specifically as supernatural, end quote. And so at this point, you should be able to see why Warfield is saying this kind of stuff. He's in a pickle. He's trying to outmaneuver the deists like Hume that reject all miracles. But then he's also trying not to give anything to modern miracle claims. So he doesn't want to sound like God's breaking the laws of nature like a criminal or something because he believes that miracles happen in the Bible. But he's also got to close the door to modern miracle claims. It's this tightrope. Like George Campbell said, to adorn error with a semblance of truth requires all the arts of ingenuity and invention. But here's the reality. Warfield would have a far more formidable argument if he'd just stick to the Bible and stop trying to straddle the fence here. There is no problem. A miracle doesn't need to be thought of as a violation of the laws of nature any more than me picking up this pen needs to be thought of as a violation of the laws of gravity. I'm an agent acting on nature. And God can do that too. That's perfectly rational. Now, I'm not saying that God can't or doesn't break the laws of nature. He surely can And maybe he does. I don't know. All I'm saying is that we don't need to accept Hume and Spinoza's premise here. But remember, Hume's argument is actually a bit more nuanced. It's not just about whether or not a miracle is possible. It's really about whether or not we should believe a miracle testimony. Remember, he said, quote, that no testimony is sufficient to establish a miracle unless the testimony be of such a kind that its falsehood would be more miraculous than the fact which it endeavors to establish. And even in that case, there is a mutual destruction of arguments, and the superior only gives us assurance suitable to the degree of force which remains after deducing the inferior. And even this is a bit too generous because in the next chapter, he says, quote, there never was a miraculous event established on so full an evidence. In other words, even this extreme criteria for evaluating the reliability of miracle testimony is just pretense. He has no intention under any circumstances whatsoever 
of admitting that any testimony is worthy of belief. A miracle, says Hume, supported by any human testimony is more properly the subject of derision than of argument. It needs to be made fun of, in other words. But wait a minute. Isn't the whole gospel based on eyewitness testimony? I mean, the apostles were witnesses of the life, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus, right? So if, as Hume teaches, testimony is inadequate for supporting a miracle, then this undermines the entire gospel. But, but guys, this is the same exact line of reasoning that Warfield takes when it comes to modern miracles. He goes about it a little bit differently, where Hume kind of rigs the scale in his favor by virtue of the definition. Warfield sets up these impossibly high standards that the Bible itself can't measure up to, so that, in effect, no testimony could ever be enough. And all of the arbitrary criteria that both Hume and Warfield require is just a kind of thinly veiled contempt. It's like they're mocking anybody with a miracle testimony. It's snipe hunting. You know what snipe hunting is, right? It's a practical joke where you send somebody out to search for something that they'll never find because it doesn't exist. I want you to look at these requirements that Warfield gives for authentic miracles. He says that a miracle has to have been complete or even perfect, like we saw earlier. Partial healings don't count. Also, it has to be immediate, like we saw earlier. So there can't be any significant lapse of time. He says it has to exclude all cures, which could happen in some other non-miraculous way. And so even if like there's another religion that has healers that can do similar things, we reject it. This is also a strange argument that Hume makes. Hume says that when we're evaluating a miracle within a certain religious context, the presence of miracle claims from other religious contexts are evidence against the miracle under consideration. In other words, the existence of conflicting miracle claims in different re religions weakens the credibility of any specific miracle claim because to him, it kind of all implies that miracles are used to support competing belief systems. So again, miracles to Hume in any religion cast doubt on miracles in all other religions. And then Warfield adopts this same kind of thinking. When he says that, if a miracle is said to have happened in other religions, we should reject it as any kind of miracle in Christianity. And it's just such silly thinking. I mean, the title of Warfield's book is Counterfeit Miracles. Now, have you ever heard of a counterfeit that canceled out the authentic article? No, in fact, the presence of a counterfeit is evidence that the real thing exists. Nobody counterfeits something that isn't real. Nobody's counterfeiting monopoly money. Did Pharaoh's magicians cancel out the miracles of Moses? Maybe the supernatural things that we know are happening in all kinds of other religions are just further evidence that the supernatural is real. And maybe that's something that both Hume and Warfield should have paid attention to. Maybe it just means all the more that we need the power of the Holy Spirit. But again, to Warfield, miracles have to be perfect. They have to be instant. They can't happen in any other way or have any counterfeits. We also have to exclude, quote, all cures which seem to us indeed to have come in answer to prayer, but of which there is no evidence that they have come without any possible means. In other words, think of it like this. If somebody's dying of cancer and you prayed for them, but you also gave them Tylenol and they got healed, you can't call that a miracle because who knows? Maybe it was the Tylenol that healed them instead of God. We wouldn't want to take the glory away from Johnson and Johnson now, would we? Now, again, look at the way that he words this. He doesn't just say you can't call it a miracle if you prayed for them and also treated them with other treatments. He's saying you have to have evidence that they weren't treated any other way. You have to prove it. Oh, and there's one more thing here. There's got to be a precise and accurate diagnosis of the specific problem. And by the way, Warfield tells us that, quote, few physicians of even lifelong practice are really good diagnosticians. Perhaps there is none of whatever eminence who has not been more than once wholly deceived in the nature of the disease he's been called upon to treat as the autopsy has proved, end quote. So you need a perfect diagnosis of the problem before the healing and since we know that getting a good diagnosis is virtually impossible, and sometimes we don't even know if it was the proper diagnosis until the person has been autopsied, I guess the only thing we could ever really confirm is that a healing did not happen, right? Yep, he's dead. This is incredible. So again, a healing has to be a perfect instantaneous miracle 
which was perfectly diagnosed beforehand, for which there is proof of no other possible explanation in the natural world, and such that nothing else could ever reproduce it, not even the devil himself. You see why I call this snipe hunting? You will never find a miracle that satisfies these requirements, not even in the Bible. Right there. See you later, suckers! There's no such thing as snipes! <laughs> Let me just say that again so you don't miss it. With those requirements, my friend, we could easily find a way to reject every healing testimony in the entire Bible. But, you know, Warfield was a modern cessationist, wasn't he? And like his successors that are around today, he claimed to believe in the supernatural. He believed in the miracles of the Bible, right? And he even says that he believes that God can still heal today. Wow, well, that's good, right? I mean, I wonder what it would look like for God to heal a person in such a way that Warfield would be okay with it. Okay, God, listen up here because... uh, Warfield's going to show you what you're allowed to do. To explain this, he quotes a Christian doctor who has a perspective that he shares. He says, quote, In the healing of every disease of whatever kind, writes Dr. Henry E. Goddard, we cannot be too deeply impressed with the Lord's part of the work. He is the operator, and we are the co-operators. More and more, I am impressed that every patient of mine who has risen up from his sickbed onto his feet again has done so by the divine power. Not I, but the Lord has cured him. And it is this fact that the Lord does so much that gives to different systems of healing their apparent cures. He has healed many a one in spite of medicine, in spite of mental healers, in spite of ignorance, in spite of negligence and poor and scanty food. 19 out of 20 cases of grip will get well without doing anything for it if we are willing to bear it until that time. Pneumonia even is what the physicians call a self-limiting disease. And many cases will recover alone if we are willing to run our chances with it. The arm may drop into boiling water and become scalded. Nine times out of ten, it will take care of itself and heal. But if that arm is mine, it's going to have an outward application which will make it feel better the moment it touches it. And more important by far, it is going to be dressed aseptically to prevent blood poisoning. It might get well by itself, probably would, but it's also going to have my little cooperation, the most intelligent that I can render, that the Lord may have the open door through which he can come in and bless it. Warfield says, quote, It is the very spirit of James, I take it, that speaks in this Christian physician, end quote. So here's what God can do in response to prayer. He can bless whatever you do for yourself. You got to use these because we, we don't mean it. Now, we're not exactly sure how he would bless it. And even if he did, you would have no way of knowing that he did. But that's it. That's the extent of healing under the new covenant. And if that seems a little disappointing to you, Warfield says, Quote, we cannot expect to be emancipated from the laws which govern the action of the forces in the midst of which our life is cast. That would be to take us out of the world. No matter how holy we are, we must expect. If we cast ourselves from a 10th story window to fall with the same certainty and with the same rate of accelerating velocity as other men. The law of gravity is not suspended in its action on us by our moral character. We cannot grow rich by simply rubbing some Aladdin's lamp and commanding supernatural assistance. Economic law will govern the acquisition of wealth. In our case, as in that of others. When typhoid germs find lodgment in a body, even though it be the body of a saint, they will, under favorable conditions, grow and produce all their dreadful effects with the same certainty with which seeds of corn, which you cast into the ground, grow and bring forth their harvest. The same laws on which you depend for the harvest of corn, you may equally depend on for the harvests of disease, which you reap year after year. We live then in a complex of forces out of which we cannot escape. So long as we are in this world, and these forces make for disease and death. We are all left here, like Trophimus at Miletus, sick. And if we insist on being relieved of this sickness, we can expect only the answer which was given to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, end quote. Wow. So, Warfield was a man of great faith. He has great faith in the power of sickness. He's a big believer in reaping a harvest of disease year after year. Yeah, bring on the typhoid. And look at the caricature that he draws of faith in the healing power of God. You can't just jump out a window and think that gravity doesn't apply to you. You can't just rub your little Aladdin's lamp, can you? Guys, look, this is just plain and simple unbelief. And you can say that you believe in the supernatural all day long. But if you're on board with this kind of reasoning, you are equivocating. You don't really believe. This is the same kind of unbelief that we see in Hume 
and Harnack and Spinoza just warmed up and reserved like old, disgusting leftovers. How about this one? Whenever Warfield encounters miracles that he can't explain, he will often offer contrived explanations like mind cure, hysteria, the power of suggestion, religious excitement, or the psychosomatic effects of brutal persecution or widespread oppression. Now, no evidence is ever offered for these dismissals. They simply reveal a predetermined position from which Warfield will not budge. And guys, again, if this is going to be the way that you handle evidence that refutes your thesis, then why bother to present historical evidence and interact with it at all like Warfield does? Why not just simply say at the beginning, I refuse to believe in modern miracles no matter what evidence is presented? So again, this is what we see even now from so many modern cessationists when they hear that a miracle has happened. They are inclined to accept almost any explanation before a supernatural one. And again, all of those Warfieldian explanations are still circulating. Hysteria, placebo effect, the power of suggestion, the emotional effects of persecution and oppression. And just think about how easy it would be to apply these same arguments to the Bible and to the apostles themselves. And again, we've seen this same kind of thinking in guys like Harnack, who attributed demon possession to the power of suggestion. And to Hume saying that, quote, no testimony is sufficient to establish a miracle, end quote. And Spinoza saying that it must be some natural cause if you see a miracle. The only difference between Warfield and these deists and pantheists and liberals is that Warfield suspends his logic when it comes to biblical miracles, and they don't. They're consistent. I've got more respect for their logic. But Warfield, he has two standards, one for the Bible when he evaluates it and one for everything else. Look at what Ruthven writes. He says, quote, when Warfield confronts the question of whether or not biblical miracles have occurred, he bases his judgment not on an unbiased rational examination of the facts, but upon the prior assumptions about the reliability of biblical testimony and its theological corollaries. When he deals with post-biblical miracles, however, he adopts the naturalistic a priori of his rationalist critics. In other words, Warfield has two different ways of evaluating the world. When he's looking at the Bible, he takes on a Christian, biblical, faith-filled paradigm. But when he looks at modern miracle testimonies, he suddenly becomes this skeptical rationalist who wants facts and evidence, and suddenly he's super shrewd and smart, not like those simpletons that believe in modern miracles. In fact, he actually refers to people that believe in modern miracles as easy at one point. Ha <laughs> ha, look at all those basic bros believing in miracles. Ha <laughs> ha! But guys, that's not rational. I told you, Warfield is trying to approach miracles from this rationalist perspective, but there is no rationally consistent excuse for holding two contradictory worldviews. One that you use when you want to believe that miracles happened and one that you use when you don't want to believe. Now, Warfield might give some explanation for how, you know, after the canon of scripture was closed and the apostolic age came to an end, the miraculous sign gifts were withdrawn, yada, yada, yada. No, that doesn't work. That's a theological argument. You gave that up when you based your argument on reason. If you're going to be purely rational and logical, you can't prove any of that nonsense. Now, just to be clear, I think there is tremendous evidence for the resurrection of Jesus that stands in a category by itself as far as evidence of historical events goes. And there are some very good reasons for believing that the other miracles of the Bible are authentic as well. But one of the biggest proofs that we have that those things actually did happen back then is that they're still happening now in the name of Jesus. How do I know that Peter and Paul healed the sick and cast out demons and raised the dead? I mean, I believe it because I believe the Bible and I believe the Bible because I believe in Jesus. And I believe in Jesus, not just because there's good evidence for the resurrection, but because I know him. He's alive today. He saved me. I've experienced him. And guess what? I've seen him do things just like what we read about in the Bible in the real world. And so when I see that same Jesus who healed the sick 2000 years ago, healing the sick today, that is ongoing evidence that Jesus is alive. If all we had as believers was an ancient book with old stories and even the historical evidence for the resurrection, I would say that we would be the most stupid, gullible, easy, in Warfield's words, people on the planet to believe on that basis alone. Because if people weren't genuinely getting born again, if people weren't experiencing the power and presence of the living Jesus Christ here and now, 
then why in the world should we believe any of those old stories? But we do believe. And Jesus is alive. And we have experienced his presence and his power. And you cessationists, you do claim that you have been supernaturally born again. So we all start out on the same page. But then you take this hard left turn where you reject what you call the sign gifts. And again, what you call the revelatory gifts. And whether you justify that on the basis of scripture or logic, you're just doomed. Because the Bible doesn't teach that these things have ceased. It doesn't even call the stuff you reject sign gifts or revelatory gifts. And in fact, the Bible encourages the ongoing practice of those gifts and describes them as things that will follow all who believe. It says that they're for all who are far off. Jesus said, whoever believes in him will do them. Paul says not to despise them, not to forbid them, and even to desire them. So in scripture, you have nothing. And then if you appeal to logic, there's no way to make the argument consistent without refuting scripture itself. And then if you put logic and scripture together, you come up with the conclusion that you can be neither logically nor theologically consistent if you reject the modern practice of the ongoing gifts of the Spirit. Now, we've talked about a lot of different thinkers and philosophers and even theologians, and I wanted to talk about more, but time wouldn't permit. But out of everyone that we have discussed, when it comes to miracles, there is one name that looms large over the whole subject, and it's the name of David Hume. And I just want to take a moment to revisit Hume because, you know, there's a lot of problems with Hume's philosophy of miracles, and these have been pointed out by many thinkers over the years. I'm not going to try to open that can of worms on this podcast. If you want to do more study about this, uh, Norman Geisler has a pretty good essay on this. Gary Habermas has a book called In Defense of Miracles. That's a a great resource. Um, Craig Keener. William Lane Craig, even C.S. Lewis have dealt with Hume pretty capably. Ironically, believe it or not, I actually think that Hume's skepticism actually supports a supernaturalistic worldview, right? Because look, at from everything that we know, based on our empirical observations of the world and the laws of nature, it is impossible for anything that comes into being to exist without a cause, Right? It would actually be a violation of the laws of nature for something to come into existence from nothing. For example, it would violate the first law of thermodynamics, right? So actually, this would be exactly what Hume seems to think of as a miracle. Look, there is nothing irrational or internally inconsistent about the idea of the existence of God. Sometimes people will say, well, you know, well, then who created God, right? But that question is only valid if you assume that God is subject to the same laws of nature that he created. Look, God exists outside of time and space, which would make him necessarily, and by definition, eternal. And something has to be eternal, right? I mean, you can't just have this infinite regress. At some point, no matter how you argue, no matter how far back you go, no matter how many universes you postulate that have existed or exist now, something had to be the start of it all. There has to be some uncaused causer. And since God is the only person that we know of, the only being outside of the system, which he obviously is because he created it, he's the only possible candidate. Therefore, for the universe to exist without the existence of God as a first cause would be a miracle greater than the actual existence of God. And as Hume has so capably argued, we ought to accept the lesser miracle and reject the greater one, right? In fact, this is actually the only miracle that I can think of where Hume's own maxim would actually apply, where it would be more miraculous if the miracle claim were not true. Remember he said, no testimony is sufficient to establish a miracle unless the testimony be of such a kind that its falsehood would be more miraculous than the fact which it endeavors to establish. And yes, it would be a greater miracle for the universe to have come into existence without God. Okay, so as a consequence, we believe that there is a God who created the world. And if God created the world, he obviously has the right and the ability to act on it. So that's two of the three things we needed. So the only question remaining is a question of God's will. Does God want to act in the world? And that, my friends, is a metaphysical question. You're not going to get the answer to that with a probability formula. You're not going to get that from logic. You're not going to get that information by studying the laws of nature. 
And so this is where religion comes in. Here's the bottom line. The question of miracles is not a matter of logic and of rationalism and empiricism and probabilities and mathematics. It is purely a theological question. And as Christians, all of our theological questions have one final source of authority, right? And what is that? That is the scriptures. When we look at the subject of miracles, Christians ought to be looking to the Bible for answers and no other source. Not mathematics, not science, not probability. That's true for biblical miracles, but it's also true for post-biblical miracles. It's true for all miracles because as Christians, we have no other source of truth about metaphysical realities than God's word. And this is again where I think Warfield needs to stand before the Bema. Look at what he writes in Counterfeit Miracles to support his theory of cessationism. This is his premise. He says, quote, of this we may make sure on the ground of both principle and a fact, that is to say both under the guidance of the New Testament teaching as to their origin and nature and on the credit of the testimony of later ages as to their cessation, end quote. Now, look, don't miss this. Moorfield just gave you the premise upon which he builds his cessationist argument. Let me read it again. He says, of this we may make sure on the ground of both principle and fact, that is to say, both under the guidance of the New Testament teaching as to their origin and nature. In other words, when we want to talk about the origin and nature of the miraculous gifts, we look to the Bible. He continues, and on the credit of the testimony of later ages as to their cessation. Okay, so when it comes to the cessation of the miraculous gifts, we're basing this not on scripture, but on, quote, the credit of the testimony of later ages. Guys, this is really telling because he's basically saying, if you want to know about the origin and nature of the gifts, the Bible will teach you that. But if you want to know about the cessation of the gifts, guys, you won't find that in the Bible because it's not biblical. And this is tantamount to Warfield admitting that fact, which is why John Ruffin points out, quote, it appears odd in view of Warfield's strong commitment to biblically based theology that hardly more than half a dozen pages of over 300 are devoted to this scriptural grounding and of this almost nothing in specific exegesis of texts, end quote. But as we've seen, guys, it is irrational as Christians to base our theology of miracles on anything other than Scripture. And yet, Warfield not only based his cessationism on extra-biblical, rationalist, critical, historical methodology and Enlightenment-era philosophy with pagan origins like we saw last time, but he also gave birth to a whole new breed of cessationists that continue to follow in his lead to this day, not only in their specific arguments, but in a cynical, critical, toxic brand of cessationism that undermines the gospel itself. Now, what I ought to do is another whole episode just showing you how thoroughly modern cessationists have imbibed Warfield's brand of cessationism. Obviously, I don't have time to go through that today, but I've actually got something even better planned for an upcoming episode. But hopefully even now, you're able to recognize the unbiblical way that modern cessationism, again, not only in its specific arguments, but in the spirit that it is of, is not the gospel, it is worldly wisdom, and it ought to be rejected as the grave and unbiblical error that it is. Well, I think that's all we have time for today, so don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time as we continue the series, Refuting Cessationism, on Daniel Kalenda, Off the Record.